We're going to go back into the worship vault here real quick and uh, we're going to pull out an old song that we used to sing and I want to invite you to sing it with me. And if you're able to stand, stand to your feet. If not, sit, it's all good. Let's invite Jesus here this morning. Presence of God. Lord is my strength. Sing it with me. The Lord is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. He is my God. Let's sing that again, church. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my strength and my soul. And He has become my salvation he is my God and I shall prepare in my heart sing it church and I shall prepare in my heart and I shall prepare in my heart the Lord reigns the Lord shall reign forever and ever. Amen. The Lord, He shall reign forever and ever. Amen. And I shall prepare in my heart I shall prepare him my heart, and I shall prepare him my heart. Let's sing that again. And I shall prepare him my heart, and I shall prepare him my. darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. 
I am not a captive to the light. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can sing. There's power in your name. Power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand. And there's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out of the grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance. When I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance. When I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance. When I stand in your love, and my fear, and my fear, it doesn't stand a chance. When I stand in your love. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Standing in your love. Standing on the rock. Amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. We stand in your love this morning. Who was there before there was creation? 
who illuminates the stars and the sun? Who has set eternity in motion? There is just the one. Who can calm the storm with just a whisper? Who can make the darkest demons run? Who can break the curse of generation? There is just the one, the one. The mighty Lion of Judah, the pure and spotless Lamb, the Alpha and Omega, the good and great I am, the God that saves the nation, the one they bow before let every heart sing out who is like who is like the lord who can carry sin upon his shoulder who and at the cross and scorn its shame who was made to rest like every other but who rose again and stormed out of the grave the mighty lion of judah the pure and spotless lamb the alpha and omega the good and great i am the god that saves the nations the one they bow before Let every heart sing out Who is like, who is like the Lord Who is like the Lord You are the one true King Lord over everything Jesus, there is no other. Jesus, there is no other. Your word will never change. Your name is here to stay. Jesus, there is no other. Jesus, there is no other. You are the one true King. Your Lord over everything. Jesus, there is no other. Jesus, there is no other. Your word will never change. Your name is here to stay. Jesus, there is no other. Jesus, there is no other. The mighty Lion of Judah, the pure and spotless Lamb, the Alpha and Omega, the good and great I am. The God that saved the nation, the one they bow before. Let every voice sing out, who is like, who is like the Lord. Who is like the Lord. The Lord, who is like the Lord? Oh, come to 
the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ Leave behind your regrets and mistakes From today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ
can't go back to the beginning can't control what tomorrow will bring but I know here in the middle is the place where you promise to be I'm not enough Unless you come, will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are, will you meet me here again? As I walk now through the valley, let your love rise above every fear, like the sun shaping the shadow in my weakness, your glory appears. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? I'm not enough. Unless you come, will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again?
when you meet me here again I'm not enough I'm not enough unless you come when you meet me here again that's all I want that's all I want is all you are when you meet me here again be the here again thank you for leading us here alone continue to just speak to our hearts as you speak through pastor to us now time just be in your presence so gripping that we don't want to leave thank you for who you are and all you've done and everything that you're about to do in your name amen finishing up our series, The Great Influencer, and we are looking at the fact that the greatest influencer in all of human history was Jesus, and how the world and society today is trying so hard to influence us, and that we really need to tap into the influence of Jesus, the fact that Jesus can influence every area of our lives, and we looked at a few of those areas. We looked at how Jesus can um, influence our minds and transforms our thinking. Uh, we, we looked at how Jesus, he, he influences our desires. He begins to change the desires of our heart. Last week, we looked at relationships, how Jesus influences our relationships, and the foundational verse for last week was, I just hope you place this in your heart, which is Ephesians 4.2, which is, be completely humble, gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. And if we would live that verse inside of the church, we'd have a whole heck of a lot less problems. So today we're going to wrap this series up. I'm going to ask you a question. If Someone asked you, what is your purpose in life? What is your purpose in life? What would be your answer? Could you give an answer? Do you know what your purpose in life is? You know, some of you might answer, well, you know what? I would just want to be a, a good father or a good mother. That's my purpose. Or, you know, I, I want to I, I be a, a good um, co-worker, or I want to, I, I think my purpose is to have a good job and make lots of money and have a good, nice car and take care of people. Everybody has what they think is a different purpose in life. Nashville-based Lifeway Research. They wanted to see if people were viewing life differently after the pandemic. Now, they had done a survey back in 2012 to see if people were really chasing after the purpose and meaning of life. And after the pandemic, they wanted to see, had anything changed? Had anything changed? And here's what they found out. That U.S. adults today are more likely to regularly wonder about meaning and purpose in this life. But check this out but less likely to strongly believe finding a higher meaning and purpose is important. So they, they wonder about meaning and purpose in life, but they don't seem to strongly feel that it's that important. Here's some stats for you that I found kind of fascinating. Most Americans, 57%, say that they wonder, how can I find more meaning and purpose in my life? And they do this at least monthly. 
More than one in five, actually around 21%, say they consider the question daily or weekly. Few, 6%, say they think about it yearly. Close to one in four, actually the number was 23%, say they never wonder about finding more meaning and purpose. And another 15% said they are not sure. Here's the thing. They may be wondering about it, but are they finding purpose? Are they finding purpose? Because, see, God created us for purpose. God created us for something. What if I told you that your purpose in life has been scripted out in the Bible? Would it change your perspective, change your thinking, change your direction in your life? The title of today's message is Jesus Influences Our Purpose. If you're able, would you please stand as, as we read the Word of God this morning? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It reads, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's read that together. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Think about that. Think about what that verse is saying. And, and be seated. Be seated, please. Man, this verse is so foundational for us, church. Because this verse tells us what our purpose is. It's right here. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, I call this another faith chapter. Most of us know in the Christian faith that Hebrews chapter 11 is considered the, the hall of faith, right? All the people in the Bible that had this amazing faith in God and did amazing things. But chapter 2 is a faith chapter also of Ephesians. In fact, Martin Luther, he used this chapter as his basis for his 95 thesis that he took and nailed to the door of the German Catholic Church back in the 1500s. And Paul is explaining in this verse, or in this chapter, I should say, he's explaining the fact that prior to us having Christ, we were all dead in our trespasses. We were all dead in our sin. That we were looking at a future of being eternally separated from God. And so Paul begins to make his case for his case for Christ. And then when he gets to chapter or verses 8 and 9, he says something very interesting in Ephesians chapter 2. This is one, these are the most, some of the most famous verses in the Bible. He says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So Paul says, look here, man, you had nothing to do with your salvation, man. Absolutely nothing. It was through faith, through faith in who God is and the grace of God that was bestowed upon each one of us that we are saved. And Paul says, it's not of yourselves. This didn't come from you in any way, shape, or form. It's a gift of God. It's a gift of God to us, man. And Paul says, not by works so that no one can boast. Listen, human nature is for us to boast every time we do something. You ever been around that person that does something and says, don't let anybody know I did it, and then they let everybody know they did it? Right? It's human nature. We just want everybody to know what we did. Boast, 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 boast. And Paul says, look, you're not going to be able to boast at all about this. This is straight from God. Right after he pins this, then he writes what, he, what we just read in verse 10. Because he wants to remind them of something. See, there's, there's a, a, a misconception in the church that we should not be doing works. There's a misconception. Now, Paul is talking about salvation being a free gift of God, but with that comes a responsibility. And we're going to talk about that responsibility. The bottom line is this, is that verse 10 tells us our purpose. And it tells us that we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That's what we were created for. When we come into a relationship with Jesus, 
We were created to do good works. Now, think about it, church. When we are saved, we're a new creation. Paul reminds us of this, right? He says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is a new creation in, or excuse me, if anyone is in, is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The new has come. So many of us want to keep holding on to that old past, holding on to that old person. Oh, you used to be mean and tough and rough and all that stuff, and you want to keep holding on to that. That's not who God wants you to be. You were created, you're a new creation. Mom and I are kind of nerds. Mom Bear and I are nerds. And so we like to watch this show called Main Cabin Masters. Just love this show. It's about this, this family that, that goes and they... Um, rejuvenate these old cabins in Maine. Now, I didn't know this, but Maine has some of the most beautiful lakes and rivers that you could ever imagine. There's a ton of lakes in this place, and they have a ton of what they call these camps, and they're actually these cabins. And some of them are hundreds of years old, and per people will purchase them. And these guys are amazing. This brother and sister who run the whole thing, they, they, they'll walk into a camp, and, and they'll, 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 all of a sudden, they just see what it's supposed to be. And then they go inside, and it's, I mean, they're, they're ugly, tore up, they're ripped up, they look bad. And they go in, and they can just visualize what it's supposed to look like. And when they're done, it's like, it's amazing. It's amazing. And, and I think about that, and I think, God, that's, that's how we were. Where were these old, torn up, ugly, worn out raggedy cabins and God God comes in he 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 takes us he he looks at us and he says you know what I am going to restore this to what it should have been and he works from the inside out like these guys what they'll do they'll strip down a whole cabin strip it down to the bare walls and they'll put in new electrical and new plumbing and then they'll put the sheetrock up and everything else and these guys are so meticulous at everything that they do and then when it's done, aesthetically, there are these beautiful projects, but you, inside what happened, on the, what, the, what's, what was done behind the scenes that you did not see was so essential to the function of the cabin. God does that with us. He comes in and he changes us on the inside. He removes all the stuff that shouldn't be there. All that stuff you're holding on to this morning, God wants to take it out of your life. All the pain, all the anger, all the hurt. God wants to remove that, and he wants to, he wants to bring something new into your life. He wants to bring peace and love and harmony and, and joy. Why? Because you're a new creation. And God doesn't want us holding on to what we were. He wants us to be what we're supposed to be, created in him. And I know it's hard. I know it's hard sometimes. Because before you were saved, before I was saved, our purpose was us. It was all about us. Everything revolved, everything revolved around me. How I felt, how I thought, what my goals were, what my desires were. Everything was me, 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 me. But when God comes in, when he enters into our lives, suddenly something happens and he begins to transform us, church. He takes that transformational power and he puts it inside of us and he begins to bring new function into our lives. David wrote in Psalm 57 too, he said, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. Think about what David's writing there. He's crying out to the most high God. He's crying out to our father in heaven. But he's crying out to him to do what? For God to fulfill his purpose in David's life. Do we think like that this morning? Because if we did, if we just said, God, put your purpose in me, the world would suddenly look different. As I said at the beginning, our desires would become God's desires. My thoughts would be his thoughts. My heart would be his heart. We become the image of God created through his son, Christ Jesus. 
So Paul says that this new creation, which is all of us this morning, if you have a relationship with God through Jesus, then you are a new creation. He tells us in verse 10 that we're created to do good works. Our purpose is to do good works. Listen to what I'm going to tell you this morning, church, because this is going to be foundational for you for the rest of your life. You and I were created to do good works through Christ. What are good works? Let me tell you what they are. Anything that brings glory to God and benefits others. That's what good works are. Not glory to yourself, but anything that brings God glory and it benefits others. Oh, wait a minute, Pastor. I cannot work my way to heaven. You just said that earlier in the thing. Now you're telling me I'm created for works. What what are you talking about here? Well, here's what I'm talking about. Faith saved us. Faith is what saved us. But works go along with faith. And we don't want to teach this in the church. It's all about, oh, it's, it's all about salvation. It's all about saving grace. It's all about grace, 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 grace. It is about grace. But James tells us, thank you, You I'm preaching hard and you guys are praising. So anyways, James reminds us of this. In James 2.17, what does he say? In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action, it is dead. If it's not accompanied by action, it's dead. You have got to get off your behinds and get moving. Your faith is dead if you're not putting action behind it. It's dead faith. It's meaningless faith. And I ask, if you're not doing good works in the name of Jesus, are you really saved? How could you not do good works in the name of Jesus? Martin Luther said this, God, God, no, good works does not make a good man, but a good man does good works. There's a lot of folks out there that, do bad, that are bad people that do good things. I know gangsters that... They'll feed the homeless. They'll, you know, help out the poor, whatever, and they're doing bad things. Doesn't make them good. But a good person, someone who's rooted in Christ, you will do good things. You will do good things. Church, we're not like the world wandering around. What is our purpose? What is our purpose? What is our purpose? Our purpose is in Christ Jesus. Jesus influences our purpose, and that Influence causes us to do good works. So how do we get started? Where where do we go with this? Where are some things that I think you need to apply in your lives this morning to help you understand what your purpose is in Christ Jesus and the things that he wants you to do? The first thing that you need to do this morning is you need to go to God in prayer. Prayer is where we start with everything, church. Prayer is where we start with everything. James chapter 1, verse 5 tells us this. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So this morning, if you're not sure what your purpose is in Christ, if you're not sure the good works you should be doing in Jesus, you need to start with prayer. Get with God. Just God. Turn your cell phone off. Turn your, pa- your tablet off. And just get with God. And start searching the Lord out. And ask him, God, what is my purpose in life? What is my purpose? What is it that you want me to be doing to your glory and to benefit others? The second thing you need to do is you need to dig into God's word You need to dig into God's word. Psalm 119, 105 says this, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Right? Church, think about that. God's word illuminates the direction that you need to go. And a lot of times when people are asking me, like, well, what am I supposed to be doing, Pastor? Or how should I handle this situation? Or, or oh my gosh, I, I, I'm failing over here. The first thing I'll ask is, well, what kind of time are you spending with the Lord? 
Are you spending time at his feet? Are you reading his word? His word is how he communicates with us. I tell people all the time, when you are making a major decision in life, you better get scriptural confirmation. Because a feeling will betray you. I'm telling you it will. Oh, I'm going to make $150,000 a year. Woo, yeah, that's a good feeling. But what about everything that comes with that $150,000? Right? What about the commute that you got to go and do? What about this? What about that? Is it really worth it? A feeling can be a false peace. Oh, I've got to have this peace. Well, Jonah had a peace, and he was in the middle of a storm, and he was the only one sleeping in the boat. Everybody else was crying out to their gods because they were going to die. A, a peace can be a false peace. Jesus said it's a peace that goes beyond our understanding. So right there should tell you, don't be looking for this peace, this little, it ain't that. Right? It sure ain't that. But I'm telling you right now, you need to be in the Word of God. And you need to be reading the Word of God. And when you're praying about something, when you're praying about anything in your life, the Word of God is there to give you direction. The third thing is this, determine your gifts and your strengths. Again, how do you do that? By spending time with God, by being in his word. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 says this, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. We all have different gifts, church. You guys have gifts that I don't have. And that's what's beautiful about the body of Christ is the fact that because each one of us are gifted differently, when we come together as a whole, collectively, we've got everything covered. Right? I am not going to go out and build a bridge. I do not have an engineering mind. It's just not going to happen. I don't think that way. Okay, That's not how I'm constructed. That's not how I'm wired. But some of you might be wired that way. People in construction or, or in a trade. It makes sense to you. Me, it doesn't make sense. I'm like, eh, you know, that's why you, I hire people to do stuff. So, um, but my point is this. You need to determine your strengths and your gifts. Because those are the things that you're going to operate in to do the works for God. Think about it. What are your top three gifts? Like the three gifts that you know you have, what are they? Can you name those gifts? Can you name your strengths? Can you say, I know that this is a strength and not like, oh, I'm so strong, but that you ha- this is a, like a genuine God-given strength that you have. Because if you don't know what those things are, then you need to find out. Because it will change your life. It will transform your life. The first time that I ever encountered the Holy Spirit, it was my wife and me and another couple and my pastor and his wife. And we were in my home. And we were singing songs and praising the Lord and everything. And we just felt like the Spirit was just very strong that night. And I was a young believer. I might have been walking with Jesus maybe, I don't know, a year, less than a year. And then my pastor says, man, let's just get on our knees and let's just get, let's just get deep into God. And so we just started praising God and just loving God. And we were around my, my coffee table of my home. And then he started praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I started praying, and I didn't even really know what I was praying. But I said, well, if he's doing it, I'm doing it. And suddenly, this power came on me like I'd never experienced before. It was crazy. I remember I'm speaking in tongues, and he's saying what I'm saying. And I'm like, how, how do you know what I'm saying? I don't even know what I'm saying. Paul says it's a heavenly language that we don't understand. It changed my life. That night I knew what gifts God had given me. And it was a life-changing moment. And from that point on, I knew the direction God was taking me. I knew what he was calling me to do. But without those gifts, without that revelation that God gave me that night, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Some of you need to have a Holy Spirit encounter. It's one of the things I'm praying about doing is is teaching on the Holy Spirit again. I taught on it a few years back, teaching on the Holy Spirit again, 
and 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 doing some I don't like to call them afterglows anymore. Just waiting on God and being in his presence, man. Doing what they did at Pentecost. Just waiting on the Lord. Seeing what God does. So determine your gifts and your strengths. And once you've done that, then the fourth thing that needs to happen is you need to start living out your faith. You need to start living it out. You need to start moving and doing and grooving. And I tell people all the time, if you want to know where to start, start where you live. Start where you live. And I tell you this all the time, start with your neighbors. Start with your neighbors. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says this, But you will receive power when the Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So he tells them, start where you're at. And work your way out. That's what we're supposed to do. It's, it's not wait on the church to come out with some outreach or wait on the church to come up with some idea. I'm telling you right now, real evangelism starts where you're at. It's where you live. It's where you live. And each one of us has a responsibility to do this. My neighborhood is my ministry. It's straight up my ministry. Any of you that know me in my neighborhood that have been to my house, I know all my neighbors. I know them all very well. I've done that everywhere I've lived. I know who my neighbors are. I want to know what kind of a person I'm living next to. I want to know what kind of a person is across the street. But then I want to engage you. Once I know who you are, then I want to engage you. And I don't go over there and hand out Bible tracts and beat on their door and tell them you're going to hell if you don't have Jesus. I just show up. My neighbor needs help to get their, their groceries in. I walk right over and walk them right into the house. Cross street neighbor at the beginning of the year. Wasn't responding, hadn't been heard from. Pat and I go over there and get the code. We go in and walk, walk through the door. He's laying on the table. He's almost dead. We know our neighbors and they know us. And that's so important. Because if you cannot be bothered with your neighbors, then you can't be bothered at all. And don't expect us to come up with some great outreach idea so that you can come and do what? You're not, if you can't engage there, you're not going to engage anywhere. I'm telling you, church, this is evangelism 101 for you. Right? It's evangelism 101. I didn't get out where I was at years ago Ministering to different places and different neighborhoods just by, I started in my own neighborhood and I learned. Another Martin Luther quote for you right here. He says, God does not need your good works, but your neighbor does. Your neighbor needs your good works. Do you understand that your neighbors are watching you? They're watching you. Believe me, they are. They're watching you. They're watching what kind of a person you are. You over there got your Jesus bumper sticker on, you cross around your neck and stuff and everything, but they, they know they're watching you. They're watching you. And they need Jesus, and you're that Jesus to them. And I just want to encourage you this morning. I'm not trying to beat you down. I'm trying to, trying to build you up and say, look, man, just get your big boy and big girl britches on and go, go meet your neighbor. Go meet them. You'll be surprised the needs that will come up. You'll be so surprised. We helped so many people through the years. When I, was li- when I first moved to Dixon, there was a, a couple down the street, and, and they had a, a son that was deaf. And uh, they, had the, they, they, they had a lot of traffic on the street, and they were always worried about their son. And so we were like, hey, let's help them out. Let's get a petition to get signs put up. So we got with the city. I knew some people in the city and went through the rigmarole of getting stuff through. But eventually there was two signs that were put up in our neighborhood that said, caution deaf children in the area. He was so blessed by that. He couldn't believe it. Why would you do that? Because it was a need, man. You needed it. We knew the avenue to make it work. Church, a lot of you guys have avenues this morning to help people, but you're not using those avenues. You're, there's so much God wants to do in you, 
No matter how insignificant you think you are this morning, you're not. You're very significant. You are created in Christ Jesus for good works. You're his son and daughter, or daughter, I should say. And, and, and God wants to give you good things, and he wants to do good things through you. Because we have the greatest influencer in our life, which is Jesus. He's there. He's in you right now. You have him. He's at your disposal. He wants to empower you. He wants to take you to places that you've never been before. He wants to bless you and use you. And you're going to be challenged. You're going to be crushed. You're going to be broken in the process. But the thing is, is that the blessings that will come out of it will be worth it. I mean, think about Jesus. Think about the person of Jesus. I'll share this with you. The greatest man in history is Jesus. He had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. Pilate feared him. Pilate was petrified of Jesus. His wife said, don't have anything to do with this man. Pilate knew. He won no military battles, yet he's conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him on a cross. He was buried in a tomb, yet he lives today, and his name is Jesus. And the very person of Jesus is inside of you and me this morning. He's the great influencer, church. Today, he wants to influence your purpose. Today, he wants you to walk out of this place today. And he wants you to begin questioning him, Lord, what is my purpose? What is it you want me to be doing? How do you want me to impact people? How do you want me to bring the good news of who you are to those people around me? How? And I promise you, the great influencer, he will show you what you need to do. And if we allow him to have every area of our lives, church, it'll, it would be so different for us. It would be so different. Submit to him today. Surrender to him. The great influencer wants all of you, not just some of you. He wants all of you, all of your heart, mind, and soul. Let's go win the world for him, church. Father, thank you for this morning. We ask you, God, to just press upon us, Lord, um, what you have for us, God. Every one of us have a purpose. We are not here to just exist. We're here, God, to do the work of your hands. And I know, my brothers and sisters, the desire is to please you, God, and to, and to walk closely to you. So I pray today that today would be the turning point where faith would turn into action and action would turn into blessing. And Lord, that we would see that your divine plan for us is so much bigger than we could ever imagine. Thank you, Father, for blessing us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you live in us. And thank you, Jesus, that you died for us and you were resurrected from the dead, that you sit at the right hand of the Father and that you love us and intercede for us every single minute of every day. You're an amazing God. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And all the church said, amen. amen.